And here's Harry with everything that's coming up on today's oh, show. Oh my god, around the world in 80 days. David Tens there, he was on Doctor Who, remember that? Um, John Bishop, Jim, Tim, do the John Bishop. Oh, uh, John Bishop. We do that once at least, and also Ringo Starr impressions, but it makes sense. No, it doesn't, I'm lying. Um, the, 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 the Jodie leaving, stuff about that. Lots of stuff about that. Is she really leaving? Yes, yes she is. And also, we sound good this time. Better than this at least. Ah! I'm the Doctor. I'm a Time Lord. I'm from the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Castelbrus. I hope the ears are a bit less conspicuous this time. You might be a Doctor, but I am. I'm a Doctor. That's probably not the one you expect. Absolutely fantastic. All of time and space, everything that ever happened or ever will. Where do you want to start? Hello everybody and welcome back to Begun on the Inside, the new Who Doctor Who Watch Along podcast. I'm Harry, joined as always. Yay! Is this, is this the new is this a new like gimmick? What? Talking you, over each other. Yeah, that you interrupt me. <laughs> because when because we now get to do these in person. Yes. Oh they don't know. Yes, you don't know this. This is our <laughs> second We actual will mention second. it again later when we get to the watch along bit because we mentioned it twice. Yeah. But this is, yes, our first full podcast episode where we're in person and also in a uh, actual recording space. Not a studio, uh, Tim's apartment. But it's a lovely apartment. If I could, I could spit on you were that close. Mm. Please don't. I won't. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're actually doing in-person stuff now, and hopefully we can do this for um, some time until we get bored of it. Yeah, um, or until one of us like gets famous sick. or... Famous or sick. They're the two. Yeah. That's what I was told at school. We're going to be famous or sick, boy. That's how the good Charlotte song went. <laughs> Lifestyles of the sick and the famous. <laughs> Uh, we're doing a news segment before we go into the watch long later on, so let's start with the most boring piece of news, and then we'll slowly make our way up to exciting news. Oh, oh, oh right, no, let's start by, um, I should probably mention, I know two two of my friends are listening, so hello to Darius, I hope you're well. Um, apologies, I just can't work out how to have you on the podcast, but once I've worked something out, you can come on. And also hello to my sexy friend Harvey Plows. Um, I know he listens, and he didn't ask for a shout out, but I know he will hate the fact he's being shouted out on the podcast. So that's why I'm doing it. So um, I love you, Harvey. I hope you're well, and say hello to your girlfriend for me. Um, it, he doesn't have a girlfriend. On with the news. <laughs> I was about to say, how did he do that, being a Doctor Who fan? Um, <laughs> but our first piece of news is that's right. We're talking to you out there, you virgin. <laughs> I, hey, 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 I didn't say anything about virginity. Oh, uh, just girlfriends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we can still... All boyfriends. Yeah. As you know, no girls like Doctor Who. Boys who like Doctor Who like boys. That's true. I feel we're working on very dangerous eggshells. Also, I'm pretty sure that I've had girlfriends who like Doctor Who. You've had girlfriends? Yes. And... <sighs> Hey, it's only like two, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's do the news, Harold. What's yes. the top piece of news? Our first bit of news is about... Uh, it's kind of the um, usual, where are they now, in terms of former Doctor Who actors. Uh, David Tennant oh, is yeah. going to be in an upcoming series, yet another adaptation of Around the World in 80 Days. Um, we spoke about this last week, didn't we? I don't think we did. Oh no, we talked about Jekyll and Hyde last yes, week. Yes, we talked about Jekyll and Hyde. But now there's a little trailer for... Uh... Around the World in 80 Days. It looks good. Yeah. I was thinking, I like it when, especially David, when he does stuff that is within the same sort of sphere as Doctor Who. Mm. This, Good Omens, Jessica Jones, you know, that sort of mythical sort of... Like, he's so good at his drama with, like, Broadchurch and... Des. Des. And what was there was a Channel 4 thing as well that came out at the start of lockdown as well where he killed his kids or something. That was really good. Um, but yeah, I like stuff like this because you can see from the trailer that he's really having lots of fun with it and he seems very comedic as well. Mm, I didn't realise like until it came out, it dawned on me. It's weird, there's a lot of adaptations of Run World in 80 Days. Steve Coogan. Yeah, there's a Steve Coogan and Jackie Chan one. Wait, 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 wait. 
Are those two separate that, films? They're, they're the same film. Oh, I thought you was like, there's the Steve Cougar one, there's the Jackie Chan no, one. No, they're, they're, they're <laughs> in the same film. Oh, okay. That sounds cool. Yeah, and like, Jackie Chan gets a top billing, because, you know, he's an international star. Do you, what Does Steve Coogan play Phileas Fogg? I think so. What he's the you, guy in the hat. Yes. <laughs> what do you think the chances are, then, of being able to get David on the podcast when, because I'm thinking that David Tennant? Yeah, I think our podcast time of the RTD era will end possibly around the time that Around the World in 80 Days come out. So we could get him on to promote that and then just bombard him with TARDIS questions. I think the fact that called Big on the inside will kind of give the game away. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. If anyone out there knows David Tennant, we've never done this before, but if anybody knows David Tennant or Christopher Eccleston... Or Billy Piper, or Freena Adjman, or Catherine Tate. Send them our way, please. Or Russell T. Davis. Yeah, yeah, Russell. Because your agent doesn't like us. Because I keep sending her emails, and the responses get a bit, bit sharper every time. <laughs> she seems like a lovely lady. Okay. But I think she should just email me back now and again. Why doesn't she call me, Harry? It's because we like Doctor Who. Is. <laughs> <laughs> I feel Those like girls don't call you back when you like Doctor she Who. She just has a spam filter when there's Doctor Who, TARDIS, podcast. I mean, to be honest, I'm going to be honest here. Um, I think if I opened a date with I like Doctor Who, I'd probably actually have a better chance. Oh No, no, no. I'm not, I mean that in the sense that there's a lot of girls our age who grew up liking Doctor Who. I don't mention it. Don't you? Nope. <laughs> I found out something very interesting, which is... Um, you know, I've, I've just finished, like, literally today, I finished um, officially um, an acting MA. And I found out that um, a lot of... I got Harry a present last week and he still hasn't got me anything. It's been, a, like, two days. It's been a week. In in podcast time, yeah. But <laughs> in real world time. Time moves different in the podcast zone. It's wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. Um... I was going to say, apparently, I found out there's a lot of um, applicants for drama school, especially female applicants, apparently, who cite their acting, one of their acting inspirations as being David Tennant in Doctor Who. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, though, because I to think... Be fair, I wanted to be an actor when I, when I was about seven or eight, just because of Doctor Who. Mm. I didn't want to be an actor, I just wanted to be Doctor Who. The thing is, I didn't want to be an actor because of Doctor Who. However... Doctor Who was my first introduction to the concept of what an actor was. Yeah, This yeah. whole thing of, because such a big part of the show's identity is that the actor, the lead character, is recast as a different person. And also, when I was watching Doctor Who, I also had this audiobook for the uh, How to Train Your Dragon books. Oh, yeah, I remember, I remember you telling me that. And yeah. the narrator was David Tennant, mm. and he did that in his kind of native Scottish accent. Uh. So I was like, oh, okay... Actors are real people who pretend to be other people. <laughs> was that was that like the what was like the first thing that sort of made you go? Oh, I want to work in this industry. Probably the first time I was I was part of this theatre group where I um, was cast um, kind of a role like a How old are significant you? talking role. I must have been eight. Yeah, and but what what made you go to the theatre thing though? Um, honestly, I can't remember. I think they came to our school and they showed. Like a bit of what they did, I was like, "Oh, that looks fun." Uh, I see, okay. But then, and then I joined based on that. Yeah, because mine was a bit Doctor Who, but mine was before that was Wallace and Gromit. Really? That's Where I cool. went on a, like Ardman stuff. I was like, "Oh, that looks cool." Yeah. Yeah. It is very. But cool. anyway, around the world day today sounds good. Yeah, it looks like fun. It looks like a lot of fun. When um, that when that comes out, we should maybe watch the Steve Coogan Jackie Chan version. Yeah. And do a review of that, even though it's got nothing to do with Doctor Who. It's weird that that version is kind of the version which we... Wait, wait a minute, didn't um, Peter Cushing do a version of Around World in 80 Days? Have a look. There's a, there's a thing, I... You talk about Around World in 80 Days. I realise like there's a lot of adaptations of Around World in 80 Days, but none of them... None of them are kind of big, you know, A-list productions, if that makes sense. Like, you get, you know, ones with notable stars like Jackie Chan and Steve Coogan... But there's never been, like, a huge kind of blockbuster around the world in 80 days. Do you like, think this could be it? I think this this uh, this seems like the highest profile adaptation we've had so far. Unless I'm missing a really obvious one. Uh, it's one of those series... I don't know, like... 
like something like um, A Christmas Carol has lots of very high profile adaptations yeah. of it and you'd think it would be a similar case for Around the World in 80 Days but not quite not quite I just so find that very interesting there's a Around the World in 80 Days in 1956 which doesn't start Peter Cushing okay it stars David Nivian oh uh, Around the World in 80 Days 2004 Steve Coogan Jackie Chan uh, maybe I'm wrong maybe there isn't a version of Pete Cushing what is this Around the World in 80 Days 2021 trailer there's like a monkey version a mon- what do you mean a monkey version Around the World in 80 Days review a charming goofy take on Jules Verne it's got, it's got like a monkey in it wait is <laughs> is that like a a, a a film Around the World in 80 Days review a charming goofy take on Jules Verne Phyllis Bob and some other people a frog and a monkey in a modest French Belgium animation that's hard to hate. Belgium. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. There's a lot of kind of um, international um, animation studios, especially making CGI films, where then you then kind of hire one or two big name actors for the English um, translation. Should we see who's in it? Well, you just said Vince Vaughn, right? No, Jules Verne. Uh, I thought you said that Vince <laughs> Vaughn was one of the, I just heard Jules Verne as Vince Vaughn. I was like, oh, okay, Vince Vaughn plays the lead. Which would make sense. That may, would make it be a very kind of sensible... It does not seem to have any... Any uh, notable names? None. Okay. None of them seem to be... Uh, well, from what I can tell, none of them seem to be American British actors. Well, their IMDb, none of them have... Uh, there's no pictures for any of them. All oh, right. Very strange. Maybe we'll review that instead. Um, yeah, no, it looks fun. I'm excited for this. The rest of the cast, I don't really know. Hmm. I don't really know who else is in it. Yeah. I've noticed like, the Around 80 Day setup is kind of like you've got David Turner as the lead and he has these two companions. Uh, it? Yeah, it does look quite good. I think there's going to be a, there'll be a crossover with uh, fandoms. Definitely, definitely. We good though. What other news is there, Harold? Uh, the next bit of news which you sent to me, let me just get up, is... Um, that uh, there's going to be another uh, Lost Doctor Who episode being animated. And I believe this is... I, th- I should have put the Around the World in 80 Days thing second, because I think this is more boring than that. Really? Do yeah. you not, are you not interested by these animated adaptations? Well, the last one was a bit naff. Did you see the... Um, the last one was like the CGI Charlton macro, one. Yeah, the macro, Terror of the Macro. And the animation was no good. I think the animation in these... Um, to, to uh, clarify, this is Galaxy 4, a Hartnell story. I think they're going back to what they had done before, the macro one. Okay. So the macro one, they did like... they Is there a, two, is there a 2D animation? I know that it's much. So it looks like PlayStation 2. It's like they filmed actors reenacting it and then animated it. No, 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 it's a 2D animation, this one. Yeah, this one, the Galaxy... Yeah. I'm talking about the macro one. Okay. Yeah, where they filmed actors and then reanimated around the actors. Yeah, so it was kind of a mocap thing. Yeah, so it, it doesn't look good. Honestly, I kind of preferred that to the 2D animation because that, they also did it kind of black and white, um, 4x3, and it kind of gets, I think, the closest you can get to emulating how the original That's true, looked. but the budget's not there to make the, anima- to make the actual faces look good yeah so it just looks really sort of there I remember I saw one clip which was kind of a close up on the Tron face and it looked alright to be fair you're wrong oh so Galaxy what's this one called uh, Galaxy 4 it's a Hartnell story go on tell me about it um <laughs> I, I know there's a the, the, there's something called the Marga yeah I can't <laughs> listen look we're called the New Who Doctor Who Watch on podcast for a reason. We don't know. Look, I, I think it's good that they're, they're animating these episodes, but I sometimes wonder if just by animating them, are they giving up on ever finding them? I don't think so, because they it do include, I think, episode three. Um, oh, is that? You can is, actually watch episode three. Yeah, in full. And there's a clip from episode one. So I think the thing is, the idea is that this is a placeholder until they get their hands on Right, the okay, I see. Yeah. Also, I, have you seen? Did you see the original trailer for it? No, I haven't seen anything. Okay, for see, it. The, thing, the trailer gives away very little. Um, it's widescreen, it's in color, and you don't see. The thing that made me slightly concerned about it was that it didn't show any of the humans. Uh, it, it showed really? just the TARDIS. Oh, no, I did see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think to me, I think the make or break in these is the um, the animation is the quality of the animation of the people because. Yeah. Um, I've watched I watched in full the uh, 
is it called the Power of the Daleks transfer story? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and that one, it was fine, but you could tell that the humans were very limited, especially in kind of the motions they could make with their oh, arms really? okay. and the facial expressions. Like, they could kind of raise eyebrows and lower them and maybe crack a smile. Oh, okay. But it was quite limited. Compare that to something like uh, the animated Moonbase uh, serial, another Charlton one. And the quality of the animation on that is so much more fluid. And I think it's different animation studios, or maybe it's a budgetary thing. I think it's more budget than anything. Mm. But I think that it can these can work, and they can look good. Yeah. But it's all about that execution. I yeah. like. I actually appreciate the fact that the BBC is trying different things with these. Uh, I'm not sure if they've quite found something that's perfect I wonder yet. how many copies of these DVDs they sell. I... I imagine it's a limited release because I think they also now do like the, they digitally release these on like BritBox Ugh. as well. I hate BritBox so much. Yeah? I really hate BritBox. It's the go-to place for classic Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> I hate BritBox. I've got it for um, Thunderbirds because at, at the university I bet they had uh, some guys come in who worked on some lost episodes of Thunderbirds I think. Um, no not lost episodes it was like the 50th anniversary so they adapted some radio plays but did it like with the marionette puppets and the only way I could watch them was on Britbox so I got a subscription and just kept it but literally I watched that and I watched the Adam and Joe show what's the Adam and Joe show? so that's Adam Buxton and Joe Cornish from like the you know Adam Buxton Joe yeah. Cornish yeah they had like a show in the 90s oh right I'm full of cold um, you talk to everybody whilst I'm just going to blow my nose yeah yeah um, I guess I'll talk about my experiences with Britbox go for it mainly it's to watch classic Doctor Who um, the Trout and stuff honestly I need to go back to it because um, I honestly only watched fully the first episode of Moonbase and I was very tired um, <laughs> not of this, not of uh, Doctor Who that was very good but um, I think well Actually, kind of Doctor Who, because I went straight from Power of the Daleks, which is a long story. Um, a long story. I went from that straight into uh, Moonbase, and that was foolhardy. I should have saved it for a different night. Um, but no, I really like Troughton, um, from what I've seen of him. Um, well, if, I understand. You, if you love him so much, why don't you marry him? He's dead, Tim. <gasps> Since I left the room? My goodness. Um, I'm back, I'm fine. I don't have COVID or anything, I've just been full of cold for about five weeks. Yeah. I went to London about three or four weeks ago and I lost my voice. Ooh, heck. Yeah, so so much cheering at, at all the sights. Mm. Wow! 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 The wheel! The wheel. That's oh, what I declared. Yeah. Like a dish, a wheel. Well, I saw it, I Must thought that was true. completely invisible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other Doki Who... Stuff do we have to talk uh, about? We have one about uh, your favourite actor to say. Jim Bishop! That's right. He's at Goodwood Festival of Speed as we speak. What's that? It's like Is a, that a car f- thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. He's coming to Hull Bonus Arena. Ooh, with Major. John? No, Johnny's coming to Oh, yes, yeah, John is coming to Hull <laughs> Bonus Arena. I knew that. <laughs> Maybe um, we could get him on the podcast. Maybe I'll just sit in the front row and shout questions out. <laughs> With and then mic- just with the microphone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Exclusive interview with John Bishop. Son! Son! Son, when you go and Tony dies! <laughs> and then I walked into the shop and I dropped the yoga all over the floor. Son, do you address the Tardis Child timeline? <laughs> I couldn't think of any more, that was it, that was my only riff. Only- Is Sasha Dolan coming back, John? <laughs> Um, yeah, what does he have to say? Um, he's just talking about... Does um, he mention if he knew that Jodie was leaving when he signed on? Did he know it was going to be her last series? He didn't s- s- express having any knowledge of that. What does he say? Tell um, me what he said! He said it's weird he'll uh, soon no longer be working with the castmate Jodie Whittaker. He's not going to be um, working with any of them. Hmm? He's not going to be working with any of them. Well, no. Uh, well, unless he stays on. That would be bizarre. <laughs> that, that's the thing. We know Chris and Jerry are leaving. We don't know that John's leaving. There's a possibility that John, as Dan, and even Mandip Gill, they could both stick around. We don't know. <laughs> I like the idea of just John Bishop always being in Doctor Who. He's a mainstay now. He's the new Brigadier. He's the new Brigadier. <laughs> 
Go on, what does he say? Uh, I mean, the thing is, would you prefer to read this? Because you... No. Okay, but I'm not going to do a John Bishop voice. You don't have to do your John Bishop voice. I don't have a John Bishop voice. No, not, no, 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 I'm still, I can't do a Liverpool accent. Yeah, you don't have to worry about Well, it. except for my Ringo. Normally I would do it, but I haven't pre-read it and I'm full of cold. Mm. I'm struggling to speak about it. Didn't I read words. something the other week in a Ringo voice for some reason? You did um, two weeks ago. Was uh, that? Um, I can't remember what it was. But you did your top... Yeah, I can't remember, but you did. I can't remember why. Mm. <laughs> was it... It might have been reading for John. Do, just do 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 this as Ringo Starr. Okay. People won't know. They won't be able to tell the difference. Yeah. Ringo Starr. Okay. <laughs> They've been great to work with, he explained. So welcoming and really supportive, particularly to someone like me, who's not done a run on a series like this before. I know everyone knows it, but as everyone says, Jody is phenomenal. Uh, the com- the comedian also acknowledged how strange it <laughs> <laughs> has felt uh, knowing his time with Jody t- would be. Oh, he did know his time with Jody would be short. Ah, okay. Saying the way Jody carries the show, the amount of responsibility that she wears so lightly on her shoulders is staggering. The run's coming to an end soon, and we're all talking earlier about how weird it will be not seeing each other every week. That that's that's John's whole quote. Just say Thomas was a huffing and a puffing. Thomas was huffing and puffing down the track. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll be honest, I wasn't really listening to the quote, I was just listening to the voice. But it's interesting that, that he knew that she was leaving before the series started because then that sort of implies... What I've always found very confusing about this next run is at what point did they get offered the centenary special? Because it seems like they finished it and then they went, do you want to do the centenary special? And then they had to rework what would have been Jodie's last special. So the, what, so we're getting three specials. We're getting a Christmas one, an Easter one, and a centenary one. Mm. And I believe the original plan was for her to leave in the Easter one. But then that they offered sense. her the centenary one. So they had to yeah. move whatever the Easter one was to the centenary one. Well, the thing is, they wouldn't have... Um, they've not started production. Have they started production on those specials yet? Yeah. They have. Okay, that's interesting. So, it couldn't have been a thing where they wrapped on Series 3 and then agreed to that before the uh, Centenary schedule. So, I, I guess it must have been decided before production on this whole eight-episode batch started at all. What what other programmes would you like to, to see take part in the Centenary thing? Um, does it have to be ones that are currently on TV? No. Because I've thing- got my pick. Okay. Um... I, cause the thing is, I'm sure they will bring shows back. You know, I yeah. can imagine classic sitcoms. Well, this is what I'm back. thinking. I'm thinking Blackadder. Mm-hmm. That would be great. Just a one-off Blackadder special. Yeah. You could even do like a BBC thing. Hey, that'd be cool. Like the foundations of the BBC. Okay. Um, so what? Um, he'd be sort of a Sydney New New yeah, type yeah, character. Yeah. You could have. Um, I what I so you could. You could do Only Fools and Horses mm. with David Jason and Nicholas Lindhurst because they're still around and the the close Trotter family are also around apart from Uncle Alba and Grandad. And of course recently John Chalice who plays Boise passed away and um, Roger Lloyd Pack is no longer around. And so, but a lot of the supporting cast have gone but the main sort of unit is still there. So you can maybe do something with that. Um, what else is there? There's that, and what I what I would really like to see, and I don't think they would do it. I don't think it will ever happen. But I would like to see current Top Gear, Paddy McGuinness, Freddie Flintoff, and Chris Harris do a special with Jeremy Richard and James. Okay, I feel like the BBC will be sticking to their guns on that one. Yeah, though. and also they're already they're still are they still with Amazon? Are they still doing? They're Grand still Tour? doing Grand Tour. I think there's, yeah. there's two more specials already filmed. I think. Yeah, so I don't. I, but I would just, one. I would just like to see that because I know that they, they, they did return. They did like a BBC Top Gear special when Sabina Smith died, and that was quite nice to sort of see them talking about Top Gear again. Mm. So because I'm like a Top Gear kid, I grew up on all that. So I would like to see them sort of come back and do that last. You know yeah. what I mean? Honestly, but, that, but yeah. I don't think it would ever ever happen. Honestly, I can only think. Now of things I wouldn't want to see. Like Primarily, what? I don't. Gavin and Stacey. <laughs> no, I, I, I like Gavin and Stacey, and we know Dan, we actually know Gavin and Stacey are coming back to do one more special. Maybe that will be a centenary special. Maybe, yeah. Um, the only other thing I can think of is 
I, I mean, I guess they could do another Python reunion, but I feel like... Because obviously they did their kind of end of Python thing, which was the one down, five to go. Yeah. And I guess they could do a two down, yeah. four to go, but I don't think... I don't know, that feels very wrong. That feels wrong to me. Maybe because there's been much less time that has passed. And also, if they made a pattern of it, yeah. it would kind of... Would it end up being like, at the end, it's just Michael Palin doing five down, one to go? The Royal just... Family? The Royal Family, okay. That would be... I'm just going to hasn't... Um, uh, 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 Carolina Hearns passed, hasn't she? Oh, uh, of course, yeah. And she was the creator, so we can't really do that. My Family? Maybe? I don't know, has it left... Outnumbered? A... Outnumbered? Um, like outnumbered, kids all doing like different stuff now. Yeah, but you can bring them back. They, they seem to come back every now and again and do... Uh... Hmm. I feel like these are too recent. I think we need to look further across, like, you know, this is the centenary. Okay. It's like 100 years of BBC. Staged. Upstart Crow. Cuckoo. Miranda. This country. I mean, honestly, I can see them doing something with kind of their recent hits like This Country or Fleabag. Not going out. Ghosts. Still game. And that ended, that ended, ended there, didn't it? We need, we need to think... Bigger Tim, you can't Mrs. Look at... Brown's boy. There probably will be a Mrs. Brown's boy <laughs> centenary special. Let's be real. Um, I bet there'll be a, some kind of strictly special. That makes sense. There will be, yeah. Yeah, um, strictly makes sense. Um, I'm just looking now. Maybe we'll get an early fool, uh, not an early fool, Wallace and Gromit. Maybe I don't know. What's What's Nick Park? Do we know what Nick Park is working well, on right now? I went. To, I was in London the other day, and I drove there and back. And on the way there, I made a playlist of podcasts, and I got Nick Park on Desert Island Discs and Nick Park talking to Mark Commode for Early Man. Might be there. Was that Early Man or Sean the, Sh- Sean the Sheep Farm Again? Oh yeah. Was um, he? A, I'm cute, just a producer on that, right? Yeah, but they, they were talking about it, and he he said, his, "Oh no, no, it wasn't. It was um, 30 years of Wallace and Gromit." Oh, okay. And he was asking, "Is there going to be any more?" And he says, "I've got idea. I've got an idea that I'm snowballing, and this would have been mm. two or three years ago." Okay, so after Peter's passing. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think I have to say, um, like I know he only really does like DFS ads right now. He's amazing. Current, the current voice. He's really, really good now. He's really good. There was, I remember when there was a period where it was a little bit. You could really tell it wasn't. Pe- yeah. It wasn't bad, but you can tell it wasn't. Peter. And now I'm going back like ten years ago yeah. when it was like. I remember like seeing like, World of Invention. Was it called? I can't remember. I remember seeing something on YouTube, and it was just like I was like, "This is yeah. it doesn't even sound." Yeah, I remember there was like a TV series called World of Invention, which he did. Where I, even as a kid, I was aware this isn't the Wallace voice, yeah. but now he's really good. Like I'd be very happy to see him doing a. Wallace and Gromit special. Whitehead. Bren Whitehead, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I think he's good now. Uh, really good now. Yeah. Um, so I, I think he's currently got to a point where he could hold carry a Wallace and Gromit special. Yeah, I'd go for it. Yeah, and I love, I love the Wallace and Gromit specials. I'm just trying to see what um what Ben Whitehead's worked on. So there's the new video game, isn't there? Wallace and Gromit: The Big Fix Up. Oh yeah, the uh, kind of the augmented reality yeah, one. Yeah, so he's obviously Wallace in that. Yeah. Um, what else is he? That's doing? kind of the biggest thing he's done. Oh no, he did those. Um, but this is way back. He did with the Telltale games, those point-and-click adventures. Oh really? Yeah. Do you know about that? Was those? No, Wallace and Gromit's Grand Adventures, the Boogeyman. Wallace that that that's it. The Grand Adventures yeah. series. It was like five point-and-click games. Yeah, Wallace and Gromit's Grand Adventures. The yeah, um, Matter of Love and Daddy was the voice of Bob the Baker. Oh! And he's all at the start. He goes, "If I knew you were coming, I'd a big to kick." <laughs> that <guy>. That's cute. <laughs> was he already was he already playing Wallace and spin off things by that point? Yeah, that's that's a very that's cute. Yeah. I like that <laughs> him and Peter technically work together on a project. Yeah. Uh, anything? Any other BBC stuff? I think I'm sure there'll be some. I would be very surprised if they don't do something with Blackadder, mm. even if it was just a documentary. Yeah, I bet Blue Peter will do something. I love Blue Peter. I don't yeah. watch it, but I love it. I bet Blue Peter. It makes sense for Blue Peter to do something. Do you think they'll do a Tracy Island again? <laughs> that would be so cool, though. Just every year, we're here again. <laughs> would they be allowed to, though? Because Thunderbirds is ITV now, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. Well, no, I guess they could do it. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what other news is there, Harry? Um, the final bit of news um, is something about... Um, from, I think, the head of BBC Drama. Is it? Yes. Is there two more bits of news? Uh, no, just one more bit. Is there? There should yeah. be two. 
No, it's just... Let me have a look. I'm just double checking. We've covered everything. There wasn't much news today. Ah. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. But yes, um, <laughs> the BBC boss, let's just find his name. Um, Mr. Uh, Cheese. Piers Wenger. Piers Wenger, the uh, head of B- B- the BBC's director of drama, has uh, talked about the uh, change in showrunner and doctor, saying, "Doctor as... what? <laughs> hmm? Doctor what? Did I, what did I say? No, that's what he said. Oh. So he, he didn't know what the show was. It was a joke. Ah, I carry on. <laughs> anyway, he said, as with any change of doctor and showrunner, we will be radical. Changes ahead. Uh, I don't think I'll do it in his voice." That, that, I don't know his voice. He sounds just like Ringo Starr. <laughs> <laughs> As with any change of Doctor and Showrunner, we will be radical. Change is ahead. Go on, carry on. That's the whole quote. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like, is that what is that what you sent me earlier? Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> and also, there's a little quote from Jody. Oh, go on. About our experience. Uh, I, I I'm not I don't really do a Jody. <laughs> do do Paul. Paul McCartney from the Beatles. There you okay. go. Um, it's not as good as my Ringo, but uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to express what the role has given me. I will carry the. I don't. This doesn't even feel like. Paul. Do John. I don't think I'll ever be able to express what this role has given me. I will carry the Doctor and the lessons I've learned forever. I know change can be scary, and none of us know what's out there. That's why we keep looking. Travel, hopefully. The universe will surprise you, constantly. Just say it was all Yoko's fault. It was all Yoko's fault. There you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but isn't the Beatles splitting up? Yeah. Well, it was, wasn't it? Did Paul McCartney do that thing on Howard Stern? I don't know. Where that, it was like, that, it, the people it was always... All Yoko's fault. People, yeah, people do that one say bad. that Yoko's the one. That wasn't bad. Thank you very you. much. Yeah. That's, um... I don't know. I don't know enough about Beatles history right now. Um, I'm trying to transition from my current Queen obsession into a Beatles obsession because that's my thing. I can only be obsessed with yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't just have a mild passing interest. My mum gets annoyed with me because she says I get obsessed with stuff. I get obsessed with. But stuff. I've got to do that, otherwise, I, I'm not interested in stuff. I have to go fully into everything that's the same. for like three weeks. Same. And I'll I'm out of it. And I won't be interested. Only three anymore. weeks, mate. I've been. <laughs> My obsession's a lifetime. But yeah, um, it's interesting. I think they're going to do something that we're not expecting with Doctor Who. And I don't. I think there's going to be a continuation of the Doctor Who universe, but I don't necessarily think the television show Doctor Who is going to carry on. Okay. So well, I think, think there might be a, like a, a number of spin-offs. I can't... And then the actual show doesn't... I can't imagine spin-offs um, supporting themselves without having that kind of centre anchor of the show itself. Well, what if they said we're going to do three more seasons of Doctor Who and whilst that's on, we're going to do some spin-offs and then hopefully the spin-offs all out will continue past that. I just, I don't think it's sustainable. I honestly don't think it's sustainable. Like, Torchwood barely, you know... From the world of Doctor Who. <sighs> but why... I just, I can't imagine... From, from the VC's perspective... If you're gonna have a big international export that you're pumping money into, why would you pick something that's a spin off Doctor Who when you can almost certainly guarantee that Doctor Who itself is going to do better? Yeah. From kind of a business standpoint, I can't. I feel they're gonna do something big with Doctor Who, a big, big change. Uh, something radical. I don't know what that could be. Because it would be, I feel like. I remember it feeling like a radical change when Chibnall was like, I'm going to have hour-long episodes on a Sunday. <laughs> I, I think I would be surprised if when it comes back... I don't know why, but in my mind, I don't see one Doctor. What what, what would you have in I don't know. Doctors? I don't know, don't know maybe if they're going to try and bring back an old actor, a previous Doctor to come back and maybe support the show with a new actor. Maybe they're going to explore the Time of Child stuff and just show histories of past doctors that we've never seen before I don't know honestly I don't fun. think it will be here's Ollie Alexander here's his companions there's a 13 series run yeah of 45 minute episodes is that it I mean what if they did really use a timeless child thing what if like we did have kind of a bunch of 
indiv- uh, we've kind of discussed this possibility before. Like you had a bunch of kind of individual series not explicitly tied to the current canon lineology. Yeah, yeah. And you could have anyone playing those. Like you could. Right. Oh yeah, when we did. We like- said you could get an A list actor to come on and play the Doctor and just for one series. Yeah. You know? You know, like, they do that with other BBC dramas. Um, Tom Hiddleston did a whole series of The Night Manager. Yeah. And because that was always just going to be a one-series thing, they could do that with Doctor Who. Like, Maybe they could do that as a series. You just have, like, different actors come in and play this role for an hour. Almost like a Hamlet sort of thing. They're just going to see what they would do with it. I mean, isn't that what um, one of the ideas for the 50th was going to be before Matt? was even confirmed yeah it was that it Clara each... steps inside the timeline and each version of the Doctor is played by a different famous actor yeah I can't remember what was it so, yeah that, that sounds similar yeah but oh. you could do that but as a series or was it fictional characters or something like that I can't remember but yeah yeah but yeah but I think you could do that and also if, it could be even better than that because without these actors having to be paying homage to an existing version of the Doctor. Yeah. They can just do their own thing, man. The, yeah, I really like the idea of that, but then what I hate, and I can already tell you I would hate it, is afterwards where you... So you would have six episodes, Johnny Depp, uh, Rowan Atkinson, Helen Mirren, Helena Bonham Carter, you know, whatever, and they would come in and do their thing, and then at the end of the series they'd go, oh, they should do a full series with such and such, and obviously it would never happen. Yeah. But that would then annoy me because you just have people complaining that they didn't get a full series of whatever. Mm. Or they would then go, okay, and now the 14th Doctor is such and such, we're going to do a full series. And go, well, I like okay. so Matt Berry or whatever. You don't know if you could, con- you could transition from... Yeah, I feel like once you've done that, you then can't go back. And I feel that's quite a dangerous step. I mean, it's a radical change. It's a radical change. I did a hand gesture there that if you could have saw it, it would have cemented that link better. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But that's all it for you. It's been quite a chill week. Yeah. Two news. yeah. We've spoken more about everything else than Doctor Who. We've spoken a lot about the centenary. Yeah. That's going to be fun. That'll go into fun now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, uh, any other news on anything else in the world, Harry, you'd like to talk about? Oh, since we laughed. I'm going to have a quick look online to see if anything's going on very quickly. Um... Let's see, I can't think of anything fun that's happening that's fun to podcast about. <laughs> world Affairs hasn't really seen my car forte. No, also, we're not from this world. Oops. Oh, shit, I must remember to Ted that. Ted Human's going to suss us out, bro. Ah, damn it. Um, no Doctor Who news in the last 24 hours. Let's have a look at the BBC website. The Crown and, the Crown and Ted Lasso dominate Emmy Awards. Oh, it? yeah, the Emmys happened. Doctor Who wasn't nominated for anything because why would it be? <laughs> and uh, let me check comicbookmovienews.com. Anything exciting on here? Um, Suicide Squad director David A reveals a couple of new stills from the A cut of the 2016 movie. We were talking about the A cut the other day. Did we talk about it on? We didn't Not on the podcast, the podcast, in the car. Yeah. On the way to the podcast. Um, yeah. That. I feel like you can't really do an A cut in the same way you did a Snyder cut. Yeah. And this is why. This is why. Um, Jared Lowe's still in it. He's still shit. Well, what I was going to say, um, without being so blunt, uh, was that um, the uh, the Snyder cut was a distinctly different beast to the theatrical cut. The theatrical cut had, you know, rewritten scenes, reshot scenes. Everything was rescored, recolored. Yeah. Refilmed. Yeah, refilmed, reshot. It's a different movie. We know that. We've seen both cuts. However, the Ayer cut, whilst the theatrical cut of the film, yes, it was probably edited together differently and colored differently, and the score was completely different. If you look at, you know, those scenes, that writing, that acting, that's all the stuff that Ayer shot. Yeah. And when you say the writing, you mean like the dialogue, don't you? Yeah. Like the, I believe the story is different. Really? The yeah, there's like the the whole subway station thing with Cara Delevingne's enchantress. Uh, enchantress is uh, the Joker originally shows up in that scene, and yeah, there's a lot. So there's a lot mm-hmm. of changes there, but that isn't 
My problem with the Aya cut isn't that the story's bad. Yeah. So my my problem with the suicide my pro- freaking out. My problem with Suicide Squad 2016 isn't that it's a bad story. It's I don't like the Joker. Killer Croc looks ridiculous. Amanda Waller just isn't very good. Uh, Viola Davis is amazing, but uh, the character mm-hmm. and I feel like a lot of the problems are the character and I and I feel like the direction that a lot of the performers were given is it the best one? Yeah, and I think, like, you know, if you were to see an A cut now in a post James Gunn, The Suicide Squad 2021, it's such a ball lake to talk about these films. I think we'll, in get it. we'll get it, I think, one day. Yeah, but one it's day. not going to be a. The thing is, I'll see it and I'll be like, well, I still didn't like it very yeah. much because I didn't like the original film. And, you know, I've seen James Gunn film now. The James Gunn film was a lot of fun. Yeah. A completely different beast, I'll give it that. They're completely different adaptations doing completely different things. So it's not like there can't be room for both of them. Yeah. But I feel like if you were to you know, take one of those forward, I'd rather see more of what James Gunn did. Do you think how much of Ju- Zack Snyder's Justice League release was down to just people just being sick of hearing about it? Um, I think most of it was probably down to the HBO Max streaming service. Yeah. Like, there wasn't really an apt platform to release the Snyder Cut on before. Like, you couldn't do a full theatrical release of it. You could do a limited run, maybe, but it's hard to really gonna, figure I'm, that out and how to market that. I'm on Twitter now. I'm going to go on to Warner Brothers, um, Twi- Warner Brothers Pictures um, Twitter account, and I guarantee... That the, whatever their most recent tweet is has some kind of Zack Snyder themed reply to it. Oh, it always does. So here we go. Also, this last is released. for um, a new movie called Crying Macho. Okay. Which has Clint Eastwood in it. Okay. Let's read the replies. Uh, da, 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 da. Hashtag Make the Bat Flat movie. No. But he doesn't. He doesn't want to do it, does he? The Robert Pattinson movie looks great. Restore the Snyderverse. Oh, um, here, oh, here we go. <laughs> this is one tweet. Restore the Steinerverse, release the air cut, make the Batfleck movie, Henry Cavill Superman, Man of Steel 2, I Stand with Ray Fisher, make the Cyborg movie, release the Green Lantern scene, Deathstroke HBO Max, we don't want um, Hamandaverse, justice would seem respect the fans. How long do you have to scroll before you get something about the movie itself? Um, Snyder is a shit director and ruined the DC. <laughs> no, I mean, no, how, how, long, how long until you get something about the the thing that that Warner Brothers is promoting? Um, do, 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 do. I can't wait for uh, literally the second tweet. Okay, okay, I'm glad some people are talking about second tweet, third tweet, fourth tweet. So the first four tweets are uh... okay. And then this one here, Dream Cloud Productions, do a Space Jam spin off with James Corden. <laughs> That's not serious. <laughs> yeah, that sounds terrible. I think it's become a, it's become a, a like a meme now that James Corden's in everything. I saw a thing the other day, and it was just that. Uh, it it just said, "I woke up from a dream and I had to check," and it's the IMDb page for the Matrix. <laughs> and it, they've <laughs> just insane. searched James Corden's name, and it's like zero results. And they're like, "Thank God." Uh, what oh else? yeah, they're bringing back the Matrix. Have, yeah. Have you seen the trailer for that? Yeah, it's alright. Yeah, it? it's cool. I mean, I admit I didn't see. Matrix uh, 2 and 3, I can't remember the actual names. Experience June movie on the big screen coming October the 22nd. What's that? June. It's coming out in October. Why is the film Restore called... Restore the Snyderverse and I will. Why isn't the film called June not coming out in June? Dune. Oh, Dune. <laughs> like D-U. Oh, and Dune. June, yeah. Dune. Okay, so the way you said it, it sounded like June. If you Restore the With Snyderverse, June. I will... I may, but only if you restore the Snyderverse first. Why are these guys depriving themselves of seeing movies they'll like? <laughs> well, they're not movie fans, are they? They're superhero movie fans, and there's a difference, isn't there? Mm, but there's a difference between superhero movie fans and superhero comic book fans. Hashtag release the Green Lantern scene. What's that? Green Lantern scene from what? I don't know. Oh, here we go. What oh, this Lantern is a scene? recent trend. Okay, so... There was a Green Lantern scene in the Snyder Cut. So, Zack Snyder on his Vero, Vero account posted a picture of them filming a Green Lantern scene. 
For what movie? Um, Justice League. But we... Today, as we see all these the Suicide Squad deleted scenes pop up from Warner Bros. Pictures and Warner Media, I ask again, where's our deleted scene from? Zack Snyder's Justice League, the main one being Green Lantern, John Stewart. Okay, here's the thing. Zack, there, you... should, there can't be any deleted scenes. The movie was four fucking Zach, hours long. You had the final say on that. You can't <laughs> release another cut. <laughs> Dude, like, you do realise the film that you... You do realise that four-hour movie would never have been released in cinemas in the yeah. state it's in. Like, it, like if you were lucky, you would have got a two-and-a-half-hour movie in cinemas. Harry, we've almost been talking for as long as an episode of Doctor Who. Do you want to segue us into um, today's episode? Yeah, man. Um, I mean, we could... I probably should, because we could, like, keep talking like this until midnight. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Shut up! Shut up! Shut it up, up, up! Podcast scans detect you are not subscribed! The Daleks order you to subscribe! Resistance is futile! Failure to subscribe will lead to extermination! Seek! Locate! Subscribe! in having you all. Harry, hello. Oh, I forgot. I've actually forgotten something. Oh, bugger. Um, you stay here and small talk. Uh, <laughs> hey guys. Uh, this is Harry. Um, so, uh, how you doing? Any, uh, any uh, single folk out there? <laughs> uh, uh, what if I were to put um, my I'm Doctor back. Who podcast next to yours? Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I'm back. Unless. I'm back. I'm oh, back. so Tim, I was doing a thing. Harry, um, does, um, Harry, Harry doesn't know about this, but you recently uh, finished university. Oh yeah, yeah. You've just done. You've got your dissertation left to do. Am I right? Yeah, I'm gonna finish that this weekend. And I was out. I was out the other day, and I saw something I thought you would like. So I got you a present. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Take uh, a guess at what you think it could be. Um, for, for everybody listening, I will take a photo of this. I'll put it on it, our Twitter. Is it a pen? See. Is it something Doctor Who related? It's not Doctor Who related. Okay. Um, I don't know. Is it like a... Is it a... Why am I thinking pencil case? It's not... Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? It's a... Is it a... Is it a bobblehead? It's a solar panelled Wallace. <laughs> a solar panel. A, what does it do? Does it just dances? He goes like that, like a little cheese look. Okay. He does that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, fantastic. Yeah, cheers. You're welcome. Yeah, that's uh, great. It was my birthday the other day, so what did you get me? I got you a little, little kiss. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hello everybody, <laughs> welcome back to the watch log segment. Uh, in case it isn't obvious, this is our first ever in-person watch log, and it's not in a car, so this no. this time, the podcast for the first time ever is going to sound good. Hopefully. Um, I know that sometimes there's an issue when we record using this software, because it goes a bit crackly towards the end, but hopefully we'll be okay. Uh, yeah, we're in an actual house, like an apartment thing, I finally... For those who have been listening to us all of series four, uh, will know that we disappeared halfway through because I had to move house, and I finally moved, and we're all set up, and, and here we are in podcast studio. Yeah, wow! It's like we actually know what we're doing or yeah. something. I like the fact we're saying this now, despite the fact that when we record the news bit, it will be we'll be saying the exact same thing. Mm. Oh yeah, the news bit, of course, yeah. <laughs> so they've probably already heard all of I mean, this. they've heard in-person news in the car, but this is, this is, in terms of the timeline, the very first time that we've recorded in a proper space together. Ever. Ever. So the, the whole thing. It's only been over a year. <laughs> uh, we're doing Midnight, which is... Oh, no, no, we're not. Uh, oh, yes, we are. Yeah, we are, but I've done it wrong. Harry, what episode are we doing? We are doing Midnight by Russell T. Davis. Oh, you... This is also the first time we've watched an episode together. Yeah, we uh, literally, just before recording, we sat down and watched the episode together. And you said it was strange to see uh, a, a sort of a, 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 an end of a mid-series episode written by Russell. Yeah, well, actually, this is the last kind of mid-series episode before the kind of three-part mm. finale, all of which is written by Russell. So it's, in a way, it's even stranger to see... 
four consecutive episodes all written by one writer. I don't think we even got that in series one, where Russell wrote most of the episodes. No, I think you're right. I'm trying to think, what were the last three of series one? The last three were Boomtown, Bad Wolf, and Parting of the Ways. They were all Russell episodes, weren't they? Yeah, but this is a four-episode string, because the finale is three parts. Oh, yeah, if you right, can't yeah. turn left. Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that I noticed is this is sort of an opposite of a Doctor Light episode. Yeah, it's a companion light episode. It's a companion light episode. And I was reading when we were watching it, that's because that they're filming turn left at the same time as filming this. Right, So that's why you only get Donner's sort of bookends both episodes. How did that feel, having just a standard... It was kind of refreshing. It was, it was nice, wasn't yeah, it? I it, liked it. I was very interested to see, kind of, especially with this episode, how the Doctor does fare, kind of, without any kind of support, without anyone with on his back. He kind of gets screwed up quite quickly. Yeah, <laughs> you can kind of see why he needs a human yeah. companion. <laughs> almost every time we always see him on his own, it's very quickly at some point, he almost gets killed. Yeah, especially with the Tenth Doctor, who is prone to arrogance. It's true, it's true. Um, one thing that I noticed straight from the start is when the Doctor sat on that. It's, it's a train, isn't it? Yeah, it's a train. When he sat on there, I, I was I really liked how Russell still manages to make the Doctor the most interesting character on that, despite the fact we've known him for four seasons now, mm. and there is a whole new cast of characters. There's like all these different eccentric professors and families and scientists on there, but yet the Doctor's still like the most interesting person on there. Yeah, he's just. Well, because he just kind of very much controls the room. Yeah. He's in, you know, he's the one that kind of turns all the entertainment system off. He's the one that instigates converse, yeah. conversation. He, he is kind of a very, uh, he kind of, yeah, he leads Do you and think, people follow. I also like the fact that he's a people person, isn't he? Like he, mm. like the, like the professor sits down behind him and he's instantly like top tens around and talks to them and. Even when he's like talking to the, the two guys who are driving the train, he's just like. He, even though at one point does he say, "Oh, I'm very clever." He's like, he, he says me. that he's clever at least twice, or three yeah. times. Yeah. He kind of self professes to be the smartest person in the room, yeah. which, to be fair, he is. <laughs> yeah, there's a few things in this episode that I feel we should mention about. One of them is David Troughton, who is the son of Patrick Troughton. Um, I was reading that he wasn't originally meant to be in this. It was a different yeah, actor. It was a last minute recast, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, because the guy who was meant to do it before, Sam Kelly, I want to say, who was in like Hello, Hello and Porridge and all that, mm. um, broke his leg. So they got David Charm in it. Yeah. Which I, I like the fact that he's in there, but they didn't really. I feel like they could have done a little wink and a nod to yeah, Patrick. I've, they didn't really do anything, really. I thought it was probably a case where, kind of, this at that point in the production, the script had already True. been I mean, pretty could, firmly could established. Could they give him a tie to wear or something like that? Mm, maybe, or a little. The flute? A little, <laughs> there was a recorder that Patrick played, wasn't there? Was it, what's the difference between a flute and a recorder? Well, the flute is like. Um, Horizontal, whereas the record is vertical, oh. and also the flute is what we all learnt in primary school and sounded awful. It did. <laughs> Thank you for bringing your flute in. My recorder. My recorder. Yeah. My recorder. Your recorder. My recorder. Yeah, and also, um, what's his name? Colin. What's his Colin name? Morgan, who plays Merlin mm. in Merlin. Merlin. No, in. <laughs> Merlin. I've never seen Merlin. Oh, I've loved Merlin. I've never seen it. Harrison is also a big fan. That's it was uh, produced it. by um, uh, Julie. Um, Why did you point to the living room? <laughs> because that's where the TV was. <laughs> she lives in the TV. <laughs> well, last, I last saw... I last saw by Julie in the living room. Last saw her name on the TV with the producers, yeah. <laughs> her and Russell uh, in the living room, yeah. Yeah, I've never watched it. It's, I think it's on my Netflix yeah. list, but... It's very much the same kind of DNA yeah. as Doctor Who. You can... It feels... It was a, the same time, wasn't it? It was... There was a little bit of crossover, yeah. Um, I think kind of once the Moffat production team took over, a lot of the people working on Doctor Who in the Russell era kind of moved over to Merlin. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Although, there, there's a lot of similar vibes, although at the same time, it's notably different. I think it's definitely... More explicitly for an ad for a family audience, Merlin. Yeah, is much more of those kind of vibes. Okay, because there was that, wasn't it? There was Doctor Who, Merlin, Robin Hood. Yeah, Robin Hood was pre Doctor Who. Or it was alongside. I remember it was alongside. Cause I remember yeah. being yeah. 
Well, this was the, there was loads of there stuff. There was that Atlantis show that was after Merlin. 2007, well. BBC. Kind of, but kind of people very much like to categorise all those kind of 2010 shows, you know, Doctor Who, Merlin, Sherlock. Yeah. Um, they like to kind of put them all together as kind of... I think it, they all had a very similar Tumblr following. I just went on to Wikipedia, 2007 in British television, and I was thinking it come up with stuff like... Merlin started in 2009, didn't it? Yeah, but you know that sort of era. Yeah. And the first one that comes up is Dale's Supermarket Sweep. <laughs> Teletubbies. The Hoops. But Teletubbies wasn't still making Returning new... this year after a break of one year or longer. Wait, were the Hoops and Teletubbies weren't still making new episodes in 2007, were they? Apparently so. Really? Yeah! I thought Teletubbies was like late 90s. No. No? The Money Programme, Top of the Pops, Match of the Day, Cory, Blue Peter, The Sky at Night. Cory isn't a 2007 British show. Cory's been Everdale, around... Everdale, really... News Round, Last of the Summer Wine. Last of the Summer Wine? That's not 2007. But they were all in 2007. They were still... Making... Okay, they were in syndication, yeah. Last but that doesn't mean they were... From 1973 to 2010. Did it actually last that long? Yeah, I've got a letter in this very box from the man who wrote Last of the Summer Seriously, Wine. Seriously, I didn't realise it went for on for that yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, That's insane. Anyway, uh, let's save that for our Last of the Summer podcast mm. um, spin-off. Um, was it Peter Sars was in that as well, wasn't he? He was! Yeah. What a nice running motif we have. Look at him, look at him dance! Oh, yeah, he's boogieing! <laughs> it's great, isn't it? There was loads in the <laughs> shop window. There was a Mr Bean, mm. the Queen... Mm. But Wallace... Man like Mo Bean. Who? No, I'm just rhyming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then Wallace as well. I mean, Wallace kind of wings out for he me did. when it comes to British icons. <laughs> um, what, let's go... What, I, I really did like the scene in which the Doctor meets those train drivers. So let's go back to that. Because I yeah. said to you, um, that man's going to die. The second he introduced himself and gave a little bit of backstory about who he was I said to you is the equivalent of wearing a red shirt in Star Trek you're yeah. gonna die I kind of said like, if, the, if you're in Doctor Who and you meet the Doctor and you're a lovely guy with a lot to live for ugh. the only instance I can think where that doesn't happen where they don't die is in Fear Her with the, with the road guy the guy who's making the road oh council guy yeah, yeah. I can't remember his name but he just does, he doesn't die and I feel like I feel like maybe he should have died what? No, no, council guy. He can't come. <laughs> I also like the fact that the train drivers don't question who he is. They don't go, can you, like, can you get out the cabin? They're just like, oh, this guy clearly knows what he's on about. We'll just let him stay here. Yeah, the doctor, you know, he, he makes you feel secure, usually, <laughs> until things get heated. What did you think to the actual Diamond City? Because we only see it very brief and briefly. Mm. Um, this was clearly one of the... Uh, budget episodes. Yeah, because I, one of the things I said is it, it, it's not really diamondy. It's just, they just sort of put a wavy effect on it, I feel. And they're going, look at the shadow! And I'm looking, I'm going, the fuck? I There's think, no shadow. Yeah, there, there definitely wasn't a shadow, but I think, was that the point that you weren't, there was meant to be an ambiguity uh, about do you think it? it's like a Jaws sort of thing where... I think so, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. What but, do you think to that whole aspect then about the fact that there is a monster that we never really see? I think it's cool. I think it's very cool that it's kind of like this monster that has to... Where you, you don't see it, you don't know what it's like, yeah. where it's from... All you know is how it's thinking, and you barely know that. Yeah. I really like that ambiguity and how kind of it's it's a very psychological episode. How it just kind of feeds into those anxieties yeah. of other people and just kind of watches and listens and copies, and that's the most terrifying thing. I like that's like, scarier than if it was like you know, up and attacking. Yeah, people. I feel it did a better job at it than the last two episodes did with Forest of the Dead and Silence of the Library. Mm. But you don't see the vi- you don't see the monster in that either. Yeah, but. I feel there was a lot going on in those two episodes that that, that sort of plot sort of kind of got pushed aside, whereas in this one, the fact that you don't see the monster is kind of the whole point. Yeah, I don't think you could get a more kind of stark contrast between how Stephen Moffat writes Doctor Who and how Russell T. Davis writes Doctor yeah. Who. Obviously, this isn't the case for every Russell episode, but here, it was very, very stripped back, very simple, very focused on just the Doctor and these people yeah. and how they're going to deal with this and how they react to this which has always been my favourite thing about yeah. Russell's writing my favourite thing has always been just his really acute understanding of people and how people work yeah, and yeah. respond to things I, I've got a note here that also says that Russell wrote this episode in only three days did he actually? yeah which is kind of I was, when I was watching it I was like oh maybe that's quite understandable because especially a lot of the dialogue 
it's right for one character, right click, copy, right click, paste. Do you think so? Well, yeah, because you think like every character is saying the exact same thing as everybody else, really. I I don't think so. I think there's a lot. I noticed a kind of a lot of a nuance. Maybe this was just me. So there's maybe a lot of stage yeah. direction. I don't know if this is me projecting. Um, just kind of onto like the actors or the actors doing a really good work of injecting personality into the characters. Yeah. But I felt there were a lot of very subtle things in how the act in what the characters said and who they said it um to and when they kind of listened to people that I thought was quite revealing. Like if you look at like Colin Morgan's character, yeah. his who he like first of all he's really angsty and has nothing to do with anyone. Then he's kind of gets really intrigued and involved with it. And then he kind of because the doctor's also intrigued, they kind of Mm. pseudo team up with it but then his parents kind of start pressing on him and he's kind of like really goes into yeah. himself I, I think there's a real it's not drawn attention to massively but there's definitely a journey there and similarly with the uh, stewardess like she she goes on a right journey from yeah she does that's true yeah point to throw this thing out to yeah. then suddenly being unsure and then realising what she has to do yeah. I thought that there were Considering how many people were being juggled this yeah. ensemble, I thought there was a really good job done of each of them having quite yeah. a clear progression. Let's, Maybe some more than others. Let's I think talk about the, strongest. the people on the train, um, especially Val and Biff, who are the parents of Merlin. Hmm. They're the most unlikable characters. Because <laughs> I've been on like National Express holidays, and there's always a family like that. And I was watching, I was like, oh, I really, I really hope they get off. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I really hope they get off this train, they really do my head in. Especially, like, the mum, because mm. she's just, like, shouting and screaming all the time. And maybe as well, because it's one of those things, isn't it, where, like, we're probably out of that whole cast of characters closer to, I keep calling him Merlin. Colin Morgan. What was the, what's the character's name? Oh, you actually made a comment about his name. Jodoff? Jedoff? It was like Jeffro, 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 because it was it was called Jeffro, not from Jeffro at all. But um, yeah, I sort of thought because you relate to him because he's closer to our age, hmm. so therefore you you really hate those two people who are probably anti vaxxers <laughs> <laughs> They are. I watch it. I'm like they're pro Brexit, anti vaxxers right there. They hate everything. They want to throw this woman off the train because she's an inconvenience. But um. And so, that, so they, like you said, every character does really get a lot of screen time. Hmm. Um, well, it's just all them. In, it's one set for the vast majority of it. Like eighty percent of this is there just is that no train. Tardis. There is no Tardis. And this is the first time since nineteen seventy five that there's been an episode of Doctor Who that doesn't feature the Tardis. That's interesting. That's right. And you know, back in Classic Who, it made more sense because they'd stay in a location for a while so there wouldn't be reason for them to go to the TARDIS here you don't see them get to the planet you don't see them get off the yeah. planet yeah. and it works I think because it's just I feel like I saw a, I think it was Neil Gaiman who did an interview where he said like the first time we were at Interior TARDIS was very exciting but then like it might have been Neil Gaiman where it's like every Doctor Who episode sort of follows the same format which is you have 50, you have five minutes in the TARDIS then you're somewhere else I was like well why not just scrap that bit and just go straight to where why I never, I've never really understood that with Doctor Who. It's like, why do we always catch them at the start of an adventure? Yeah. Why not? We have to go through, through, through the whole. Where are we, Doctor? Yeah. Well, yeah. we are in this yeah, place. Exactly right. Why not just go straight to the there? Uh, David Tennant's hair. That's on point in this episode. Did you? Did I really didn't notice? It yeah, seemed... I sort of thought that there's a lot of side profiles of David Tennant in this episode, mm. and I looked at his hair a lot. Yeah, I know. Is this the first time that we? Or it's a we new outfit. It, isn't yeah, it, the yeah. Kind of, the open the shirt partly undone with the t-shirt underneath. Not a, yeah. not a single tie. We should probably talk about the repeating of uh, each other's dialogue. Uh, there's a lot of. Lip, not lip syncing, but syncing up with each other. Yeah, which is um, all done on set. Is it all done? Well, some of it is. There's definitely bits where it cuts to her, but I would be surprised if but there when wasn't. It's like, a when lot it's of David things. and her and Sylvester talking to each other, hmm. it's not split screen. Oh yeah, that's yeah. totally yeah. But I think a lot of stuff like just in the scene in general had to be ADR. Oh, it must or, yeah. or just layered. Mm. So yeah, because there's a lot of cuts, isn't there, where they're all arguing with each other. So. Yeah, but the fact that they kind of, it's very cool that kind of for, there's a huge chunk where she's just talking underneath all. And she's of not them. even on shot. She's not even in the scene. Yeah, she's not there. You can't see her on the camera. But 
I thought that would get annoying, but you very quickly just yeah. get used to it. Yeah, and I think it's the fact that like, she really kind of matches their intonation at yeah. that point as well. And just kind of, it's just like this, it's like how, you know, sometimes like a film score, instead of having some sort of um, melody, there'll be just some kind of like low bass line yeah, yeah, yeah. undercutting everything, but feeding into the atmosphere. It's very much like that, that this kind of, running alongside everyone's dialogue just kind of like feeding into this tension and anxiety that everyone had yeah hmm. um i've got a note here that says i was really surprised i enjoyed this episode because i normally hate the doctor episodes where they're trapped impossible planet that's interesting 42. but there's something about this one and i think was was impossible planet written by russell um, no, it wasn't. And I wonder if that's why I really like this episode a lot more, because it's got Russell's touches on it. So. Yeah. Because those have always been my least favourite episodes of those mm. series. Impossible Planet was my least favourite. 42 was definitely really low down. But there's something about this one that I really liked. Mm. I think... I mean, I couldn't tell you what it is for you. Maybe it's just because it's so focused and there's... I know there's a, there's a lot going on with what little there is like stuff like Forty Two and Impossible Planet they're on the, these huge bases they're constantly yeah. running to different places and there's monsters capping them all off whereas here it kind of just has faith in this ensemble and this scenario and it just digs into it and I wonder everything. if also it's because it's they lose the companion character hmm. so you I always feel like with a companion character you're sort of because in, in, in 42, the Doctor goes nuts. And in this episode, he goes nuts. But in 42, you have Martha there sort of trying to hmm. solve everything. So I feel like you then latch onto Martha. Yeah. And you, then, you can then become frustrated at Martha for not knowing what she's doing. Yeah. But with this, because Donna's not there, you're sort of just watching it. And yeah. I feel that sort of takes you out of the action enough yeah. for you then not to be annoyed by the characters in it. Mm. Like, there's a lot of the characters in this are annoying characters. But it works because they're in a, an environment in which they are entitled to be annoyed. Yeah. But like with 42, I'm always like, watch it going. I, f- I feel because every. With 42, no one's ever been on a spaceship and that's never happened. Mm. But everybody's been on a train, everyone's been on a bus, everyone's been stuck in traffic. Mm. And I feel maybe that's what people are relating to with this episode. Yeah. It's not the fact that there's a monster that's making everybody copy each other. It's the actual human element of it that everybody's relating to and maybe that's why it's more enjoyable than yeah totally and it's like ones. I think the one bit that was really like immediately relatable was um, when the train first stopped and uh, the doctor asked um, that one small question about kind of the oxygen yeah and one person picks up on that uh, and it just yeah. escalates yeah. and it escalates <laughs> and escalates until it, at the, it comes to that climax of that we can breathe on here for like 10 years yeah. and everyone's like oh we all that fuss over nothing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And that's so identifiable. What did, what did you think of the Doctor being overruled? And, and I don't just mean when he, his body's being taken over. I mean when he's trying to convince everybody that they shouldn't murder this poor woman. Yeah, it's cool. And it's interesting because on hand, you know, we know the Doctor's the hero. We know he's right. We trust him. Yeah. But we can also see exactly why in that scenario people would not trust this guy. Yeah. Like, this guy, he swaggers on, all interesting, he's called the Doctor, he seems to know what he's doing, he's yeah, yeah. Self-procre- self-professed as very clever. Yeah. I can understand why people would turn <laughs> against him. They're wrong to, but I get how they got to that place. Yeah. And I like the frustration you see in the Doctor as yeah. well, as sort of going, he doesn't know what to do because mm. this never happens. Yeah, normally you'd have Donna or Rose backing him up, just like, don't worry, this guy, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. And, like, this grounded human, where the Doctor, he isn't, he wants to be grounded. Like we said, he loves interacting with people, but in that scenario, it's gotten so escalated, yeah. and he can't help but escalate with it. He can't help but become absorbed in this bigger thing and yeah, kind yeah. of lose his kind of grounding. I'm looking forward to seeing what's to come then with um, the final special, especially Waters of Mars, which yeah. is a you know trapped on a base episode, yeah, in which he's on his own, in which we know he does sort of go ape shit, yeah. So it's going to be entertaining to sort of see how. I feel like this is this is like the start of those specials, really. Well, I don't know that that whole Time War Victorious arc is kind of. I feel like it. We first saw a real glimpse of it in uh, Voyage of the Damned. Yes, but I think that is that thing of like this is what happens when the Doctor doesn't have someone with him yeah, because yeah. it's like you know we see it kind of again 
with um, sort of with um, uh, Fires of Pompeii, where yeah, it's yeah, shown yeah. that's such a clear episode where this is why the Doctor needs. You can someone. even go back to Runaway Bride mm. when he kills Arachnos. Yeah, and like Donna's like telling him to stop, and he's just like, "Fuck off!" <laughs> it's just like I'm gonna kill this massive spider. Mm. Yeah. But I, I don't know, but this one did feel like the start of those specials, and I'm not sure why. Mm. I think there is a mention of knocks, isn't there? Does someone say he will knock four times? No, uh, when they, they knock on the door three times, and then whatever it is knocks back. Oh, uh, okay, right, okay. That's three times, not four times. This episode of Doctor Who Harry was adapted into a stage play. It's think, been adapted twice, I think. Oh, has it? Yeah, by different people. The episode has gone on to be adapted into a stage play. It received mixed... R- 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 it received a mixed response with one reviewer saying it was probably only of interest to really hardcore Whovians. That's interesting. That's interesting. I've not seen, I know there's recordings of one production. Yeah. Which I think was a student production. And to its credit, it actually emulated the set remarkably well. Well, I was watching it because I read that and then I'm watching the episode. I thought, oh, this would actually make quite a good... <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very self-contained. It's probably... there's. No visual effects apart mm. from the city. Yeah, uh, I think if you really stripped it back of these people are on a train and there's something else with them. If you remove even you could remove the sci-fi element. You can remove the doctor to. Well, you can't remove the doctor because how he plays against everyone else is pretty important. Yeah, yeah. But no, I like it. It was a good fun episode. Mm. Um, of which I was surprised I was going to enjoy because one of those episodes where I always see people banging on about it, and I much they enjoy it. Same with Blink. Mm. And I saw, I really enjoyed Blink but I remember being underwhelmed because cause I remember watching Blink when it first went out and thinking yeah good episode and then like the years that followed people going that was an amazing episode and I was like well yeah whatever and then when we came back to rewatch it I was like I'm really excited to watch this episode because I clearly misjudged it when I first watched it mm. and then when we watched it I was like oh I got the same feeling I did when it first aired mm. but now I was expecting that again with Midnight but what I got from Midnight is what I was hoping to get from Blink. Right, that's so, interesting. I really enjoyed this episode. Now, I'm glad you said that because I'm going to be transparent for a second. Midnight is probably my favourite Doctor Who episode written by Russell T Davis. Oh, really? Yeah, no, I really love Midnight. I think it's uh, it plays absolutely into his strengths, which I've already kind of outlined. I think it's just so so compelling and it does so much with so little and yet it's still undeniably Doctor Who yeah I think it's a yeah I think oh, it's an excellent we, piece of writing we haven't spoke about Rose Tyler oh yeah who gets a nice little cameo I, I remember thinking the other day I was thinking we haven't seen her in a while when was the last time we had a Rose cameo we had her in episode one mm. there was a reference to her in Fires of Pompeii there was but I swear she made another appearance in the series at one point um was she mentioned during some time Shadow in Poison Sky? I feel like we've seen her, haven't we? Haven't we seen her? We saw her in the first episode of this yeah. series, but I don't know. What if do we've you think that's uh, having her appear on that little TV screen? Because I said to you when she appeared that, like, it's quite funny watching it now because you're like just turn around, mm. <laughs> and there's other screens on that train as well. Yeah. So surely he must see her at some point, but. Um, after that you're then just constantly watching the screens mm. like there's a lot of shots where it's framed where the doctor's taken up one half and then in the background the other half is taken up by a blurred screen and you're watching the screen expecting um, Billy Piper to appear again so what? Did, how do you think that whole thing works? I think it's cool whilst I've... I look to see if she did appear in another episode mm. I think it kind of uh, helped um because obviously, kind of Russell likes kind of having these underlying running um, story arcs. You know, Bad Wolf, um, Torchwood was much more explicit, and then Harold Saxon also. Yeah. And this is kind of it's weird that this at times Rose coming back is way more explicit, like at the start. And then here, it's kind of this. It's not a blink and you'll miss it because I think it's very clearly framed that you're meant to yeah, yeah. note Rose. Um, but I think... That said, I nearly did miss it. Did you? Because <laughs> I was making a note on my phone and I looked up and she was already there. I was like, ah, there she is. <laughs> but yeah, I know what you mean. It's not so much of a, a background theme, is yeah. it? It's more... kind of, Russell wants you to know she's coming back. And do you think do you think they have become more um, in your face? I don't know. I think Bad Wolf is probably still, this in series one, the best execution of it. Because it's something where literally... 
if you're not looking for it, you won't notice it. And it's one of those repeated viewing things, isn't it? As yeah. Well, like I've seen people react to Doctor Who series one for the first time, and it's interesting to watch like when they start picking up on Bad Wolf. Oh, that's cool. Like I remember, like um, I think it was Blind Wave. I watched their series one reaction, and the first time they note Bad Wolf is um, when it's graffitied on the TARDIS, and one of them writes it down. And it's then with each subsequent episode they start noticing it. it's like what is this bad wolf thing? Oh really? Yeah. And then they were really satisfied when it paid off at the end. <laughs> and I don't think um I think maybe like we were always spoiled by Bad Wolf and now it's impossible to put in something like that without people picking up on it. Yeah. Like, you know, stuff like uh like a hybrid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Although like a hybrid was much more explicit because Capaldi said the phrase like a hybrid in pretty much the same way every episode. Rose Tyler was in the Poison Sky. She, Where was she, she appears on the TARDIS monitor very briefly. Oh, was it like well, that was a blink in your miss? Yeah, one. that was. I think, that yeah. was. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I knew we'd seen her at some point. I, yeah, I like it though. It's fun, isn't it? Sort of getting these little excitement things, and also if you, if you are a new, if you are new to this. Like this is your first series for some reason. Mm. That sort of encouragement. Oh, there's every possibility. Back. Series four in the UK was like the most viewed series. This episode wasn't. got eight million people watching. Wow, that's insane! It's, yeah, that's. I mean, isn't that like how many episodes did Jodie's first episode get? Nine million. Ten. It Ten t- million. It touched on Jodie's first episode got more views than Chris's first episode. Did it really? Yeah. That's cool. I didn't realize it was such a then had well, not like a fifty percent drop off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like like three episodes yeah. in it, I think it was getting like five million. Yeah. Whereas Doctor Doctor Who series four is kind of like it was escalating and escalating, wasn't yeah, yeah, it? Like yeah. the fin- I know like. Was the end of time? Was a uh, no, um, Journey's End like the most viewed episode? Uh, Voyage of the Damned, the most. Oh, viewed that's it. Yeah. yeah, but I know there were huge views. I, I remember being in the bank with my parents, and like it would have been a Saturday because the guy at the bank was really like, oh, "So what are you doing today? Like with the rest of your day?" And my dad would have been like, "Oh, we got to get home because he wants to watch Doctor Who." And then I remember, like, the guy in the bank, like, getting excited. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, it's on tonight. And we were, like, chatting about it. And I was only, like, eight. <laughs> yeah. People like Doctor yeah. Who. People loved Doctor Who. Yeah. It's so weird to think that Doctor Who was... I mean, we've said it already. It was Line of Duty. Yeah, Doctor Who <laughs> was what Line of Duty is now. Yeah. 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 Oh, just remind me that Strictly's on tonight. It is, isn't Strictly's it? coming back. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? There's also room that we could possibly get a Series 13 trailer today. Really? Well, Strictly, if they're going to put it just before or just after Strictly is, is that when they do it it's that's interesting they've done it in the past it would make sense but yeah. um, I feel maybe I have to say if that does happen the thing is the funny thing is if that does happen and there's a series 13 trailer we've already talked about it in the news segment oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so you'll know yeah yeah yeah. but I think that'll really kind of stick it to the people who say the BBC don't care about Doctor Who that's true because the BBC clearly care about Doctor Who they're giving them a, t- a centenary special that's true that's true Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why but a group of people on this train um, some of them remind me of the characters from Love and Monsters with Linda and I think it would have been quite cool to maybe have one or two of them appear that's interesting but then this episode is set so far in the future you yeah can really bring those I back. mean I think the thing that probably did it was um, when David Trans character gave that presentation that it was, was very that was it. that's when I made the note yeah because yeah. it of, um, I, w- I was going to say it's Larry Lamb but it's not Larry Lamb is it it's somebody else in that mm. episode who plays uh, the uh whatever his name is mm. I was also when we were watching that you sneaked in a little uh, Absorbable. double off joke <laughs> yeah he does doesn't he uh, that's Tim's theory that the creature in Midnight <laughs> is the Absorbable off <laughs> Harry anything else to say about Midnight before we move on oh, I don't think so it's just a really solid episode good um, quiz time you you not me I hate being patient patience is for wimps Now, okay. um, we only have two questions. It's normally four, but we've only got the two. Okay. Because uh, normally I would re- I would watch this twice. Okay. <laughs> um, so here's your questions, Harry. Uh, how many hours there and back is the midnight trip? Four. Altogether? Oh, altogether is eight. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Okay. Um, how long does it take for the pressure wall to collapse? How long? It's like 15. Oh, the pressure wall. Um, was it ten seconds? Oh, six seconds, Harry. Oh, there you go. You got your fifty percent. Uh, 
question marks. Oh. So congratulations. Harry, do you have anything to recommend? Before I go, I just want to tell you, you were fantastic. Oh, I do. Well, I can have something to recommend. I did have something to recommend. Well, can I have two things? Because I have a recommendation and I that. have a plug. Um, <laughs> so my recommendation is a show that was on Channel 4 a couple nights ago. It was a Jack Thorne one-off drama um, called Help. Um, was that with Jodie Comer? Yeah, with Jodie Comer and Stephen Graham. Yeah, I saw it's, that, yeah. It's... Well, I didn't watch it. It was, it was on when I was moving in. Ah. But no, I, 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 saw it, I saw it via watching Gogglebox. Yeah, it's worth a watch. <laughs> it's definitely worth a watch in full because it's a really, really compelling piece of drama. It really kind of shines a light on some of the real issues that were happening and were overlooked. Was it just a one-off? It was just a one-off, yeah. Oh, okay. it's a, I think it's feature length. I think it was two hours or oh, yeah, maybe yeah, a little yeah. shorter, but it was really good. Uh, fantastic cast, brilliantly directed, excellently written. One of the best pieces of drama I've seen in a while. Um, <laughs> also, Russell T. Davis actually posted about it on Instagram. He oh, was a he? big fan of oh, it, good, good. which is tr very well deserved. It was an excellent piece of work. I don't want to say too much. Um, you know, it's not an easy watch, I will say. It's yeah. not an easy watch by any means, but it's worth watching. It's kind of very, you know, it's, it's great. Um, and so for my uh, little plug, uh, this will be coming out next Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, I might be plugging this a second time then. Okay. Um, but uh, mention it in the news at the top as well. I will do. Um, I am going to soon be if for those of you in the York area. I don't know how many of you there are. Uh, I'm going to be in a uh, show. Um, called Put On Shorts at the Theatre at Forty One. You've just reminded me. I need to go to Sports Direct later and buy some gym shorts. Okay. I was wondering where that was leading. You, I actually need to do that as well. Okay, thank you, sorry, yes. carry on. But anyway, um, if you're interested in that, you can go on the Theatre Up 41 website. It's a lovely little venue. What's the website space. link? Say it out loud. I don't know the URL off the top of my that. head. Um, but that show is running uh, from Wednesday the 29th of September through to Saturday the 2nd of October every evening, 7.30. What's it called? Uh, put on shorts. If you search Theatre at 41, the actual at symbol. Okay. Yeah, and if you look at what's on, you'll find the page there, and you can drop the link in. And I'll also be promoting it next week. Um, you'll be able to probably tell in this podcast how successful I'm being as an actor, depending on how often I'm plugging jobs. <laughs> um, I'm l lucky to say that I'm doing the pretty well right now. Theatre for 41. That's right. The number 41. Okay. Oh, yeah, here it is, yeah. Yeah. So, link of Tim will find the link for that. www.421monkgate.co.uk. Yep, and the show is called Put On Shorts. Uh, it's a kind of selection of short plays, some of them funny, some of them a bit more poignant. If you like uh, theatre, if you're in York, if you like me. I might come along and I'll sign something. It, it's not a. It doesn't, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's going to turn into a bigger on the inside publicity event because that's not oh, what well, it yeah, is. I'm going to turn it with a lot of banners. Get a prince and t shirts. Yeah, hand them out to the cast. When I appear on stage, you'll be like, look, it's Harry from the bigger on the inside Doctor Who podcast. <laughs> and I'll look at you very venomous, venomously. <laughs> Is this because... Did we mention that my... T uh, I got figured... Have we meant... No, we'll leave it. We'll leave it for if that sitcom comes out. Oh, okay. We'll leave that. Um, I'm going to recommend... I was in London this week? Yes. Yeah, I was. Yeah, Monday I went to London. I went to press night of Back to the Future the Musical. It's the fourth time I've seen it, so slightly biased. But um, carrying on the theatre trend, but go and see it if you can. It's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good piece. It still holds up after the fourth It viewing. does. When I was there, it was a different guy playing Doc because the guy, who, Roger Bart, who plays him originally, I think he's contracted COVID or something. Oh, dear. So apparently he's okay. But uh, So they got an understudy in. Hmm. But since then, all the cast have got ill. So they've oh. had to cancel like, all performances until until Monday. So by the time this goes out, the performances should be back. Okay, that's good. And they've scheduled like their West End Live stuff as well. So... Also, Doctor Who Time Fractures is meant to be coming back as well soon, which is good. Brilliant, brilliant. They sorted out what was wrong with the building. It did flood, I think, didn't it? It flooded, like, multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't laugh, but in hindsight, it's one of those things where it's like, the chances of that happening are I think so there was pretty bad flooding throughout London. There though. was, wasn't yeah. there? Yeah. 
Yeah, I know that um, Brian May moved out of London because of the flooding. Oh, did he? Yeah. And <laughs> Brian May was actually at the uh, press night, wasn't he? was. He? I saw Brian May. I turned around and he was just stood there with his wife. Yeah. And it was one of those things where out loud I went, oh my God. <laughs> well, yeah. And I've met like famous people. I've met Tom Cruise and I did. I wasn't like, holy shit. I, I mean, I was. Mm. But I didn't sort of out loud go, oh my God, it's Tom Cruise. But I turned around and like, I think like it, it was the equivalent of walking down the street and seeing and seeing David Tennant in his Doctor Who outfit. Yeah. Because Brian, because you only see Brian May wearing what he wants to wear. Yeah. And he turned up wearing what he wants yeah. to wear. I guess it was just unexpected as well. It was as well. And yeah. Bri- I guess that's just he's quite a, got he's got quite a distinctive face and yeah. he's kind of associated with like one of the most iconic bands ever. Yeah. So and Andy Serkis was there as well. Mm. Well, he, director yeah. of Venom, let there be carnage. That's I realised <laughs> when I saw him like post himself at the premiere. Oh, that's why he's in London. Yeah, he's there for the. And he's also I, Alfred in the new Batman movie. He is. And it's Batman Day today, and this isn't a coincidence. This is a coincidence. Tim's wearing a Batman T-shirt. I am. There's also a Batman pop. There's a lot of Batman vinyl. stuff in here. Yeah, Tim has a lot of Batman stuff. Um, that's it. <laughs> we both looked around the room for another. Batman. There's literally one vinyl. Pop vinyl, and then of, there's um, a ba- there's another Batman statue in the other room. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a Batman statue in the other room. Opposite, is there, is there uh, anything else? That's it, I think. You used to, yeah, all your most of your, because you, your uh, bedroom back home is like a huge kind of nerd paradise. Yeah, I've sort of left it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I kind of did that. I kind of didn't take any nerdy stuff. Where are you going to put Wallace? Wallace, oh, I don't know. I'll figure it out. Probably on my uh, windowsill, so Good. it'll get all the sun. Good. Yeah. Anything else, Harry? Before we wrap this one up. Uh, no, um, there's been a pretty good one. What are we doing next week? Next week we are doing, are we going to do each finale episode as own individual one? I can't remember. Okay. I've got it scheduled. Because I I feel like it makes sense to do turn left as a standalone. Uh, turn left is a standalone. Yeah, yeah, definitely turn left. So yeah, we're doing turn left. I wish that our uh, political system could turn left, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> no. Make sure you subscribe to the official Bigger on the Inside podcast.